Well, good morning. If you have your Bible, please turn to Genesis 29. Genesis 29. And when I woke up this morning, this is not where I thought I was going to have you turn. So I'm eager to see what the Lord will do today as we look together into His Word. But as I was getting ready, as I was preparing this morning, seeing the Spirit was leading in a little different direction, still the same theme, we'll have the same theme through the week, and that is this, that God comes through right on time. If you get one thing down from all of chapel this week, God comes through right on time. Not a moment too soon, never a moment too late, very often not the way we expect. But He comes through on His plan, on His time to accomplish His purposes which are so much bigger than us and He cares about us. Romans 5.6 is a verse that captures this really well. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's every single one of us. But He came right on time. Galatians 4 calls it the fullness of time. Or when Jesus began to preach in Mark 1, when He came, He said, the fullness of time has come. The time is fulfilled. It's time to repent and believe the Gospel. And so we're going to be tracing through several biblical characters, through several stories that you probably know pretty well. God coming through right on time. And we're starting again in a different place than I expected when, we woke, when I woke up this morning. We're starting with the story of Leah. Anybody here named Leah? Leah? Okay, great, fantastic. Any Jacobs here on this side? Okay, I see one. There we go. We got a Jacob. Any Rachels here? Not a Rachel in the bunch? That's amazing. Now, as you know, those are all Bible names, and they're from the same story, from Genesis, and their story is actually a really big mess, right? Jacob has been sent to his uncle Laban to find a wife, and so that his brother won't kill him. That's the main reason. But God has a different plan, and that's how God often works. He even works through the wrong things that people do. That's another theme that we'll be exploring this week. And that is not like for you to use on each other. It's like, oh yeah, I said that. That was mean, but you know, God will work through it for you. Please do not apply anything from this week that way. That I can sin and God will still make it okay. We don't plan that way. And God knows how to work through even the worst sins to accomplish His purposes. And He keeps His promises. We think even of Jacob's grandfather, stepping it back a couple generations with Abraham. God gave him a promise that he would have a son. Now He was 75 years old when he got that promise. His wife was 65. And as you know very well, that promise wasn't fulfilled for another 25 years. And along the way, there were ups and downs. They were trying to accomplish things their own way, which went wrong. And God still worked. He still blessed. He still cared for them. And He came through at the exact right time. So that son was Isaac. And now Jacob is one of Isaac's sons. And he goes away from his family to his uncle Laban, Uh, This isn't a story about marrying your cousin. Again, there's not a lot of direct application with some of this stuff. Definitely the part about having two wives. Do not recommend, okay? (laughs) It's not the point of the story. A big big part of the takeaway of the story is that that's actually a really bad idea. And it doesn't go well at all. But as we consider Jacob and Rachel and Leah's 
story. There's often so much made of Jacob's love for Rachel, and that's real and it's true. But there's one who tends to be forgotten in this story, and she's the one who was forgotten in the actual story itself, and that is Leah. Jacob, upon meeting Rachel, sees that she's beautiful and says, I I want her. I want to marry her. He finds out that she's related to him, which was a reason to get married back then. That'd be if you met your first cousin, you wouldn't do that now, but that's what they did. And he goes and he lives and he works for his uncle, and he gladly works for his uncle for seven years. For Rachel. And the text tells us it seemed like a few days to him. Now, when you get to the end of seven years, there's sometimes as you get older, like I am, you look back and go, wow, seven years ago was not very long. Most of you at your age, seven years ago, you were really different than you are now, right? Seven years is still a long time to you guys. It's getting shorter <laughs> to, uh, to people like me. But for Jacob, it wasn't just because, oh, he's older and so he's lived more sevens. It's because of his great love for Rachel. And at the end of that seven years, they have a big party. His uncle Laban throws a party. There's a wedding. And in the morning, as you know, who is it? Leah. It's like, this was not the deal, right? Jacob is upset, understandably. So Laban, and Leah's actually in on this, right? She's part of the trick. Like, she knew what she was doing. Now, she may have been forced to do that by her father, but she knew what she was doing. Jacob ends up working another seven years for Rachel again. And now he's worked 14 years total, ends up with two wives. And then the competition begins. You guys don't know anything about competition, right? Whether in sports or music or anything like that. It's just all love. Yes, and I'm sure that's what all of this week will will be. In the afternoons, in some break time, in some activities, it'll just be all loving and encouraging. The other team scores a point in Frisbee, and you're like, yes, great job. (laughs) What? Are you you sure? Okay. And in music, right? It's like, they got that chair. (laughs) That was my chair. Again, I'm sure none of you have ever felt that before. They're not fighting over Frisbee points or chairs. They're fighting over love, right? Because sometimes when we're thinking about chairs and where we can place, that's where we end up placing our identity, where we place our worth, right? I'm valuable, and here are the receipts, right? And it's why... Athletes are driven to succeed, right? It's never enough. It's not enough to win back-to-back MVPs. If you don't win the championship, you're nothing. And now, what is the joker if you're into basketball, right? That's what he has done. And now for those from Pennsylvania, Embiid has his MVP, but his career will feel incomplete. It won't be validated, right, without a championship. He doesn't want to be Charles Barkley. This isn't a basketball camp, okay. (laughs) What are they striving for? It's not just success, right? It's status. Ultimately, it's love. And so there becomes a race for children. That is a proxy war for Jacob's love. But of course, Jacob, we already know who he loves. And they both already knew who he loved. Jacob loves Rachel, not Leah. And the text couldn't be clearer about this. Their story plays out over chapters 29 and 30. And we're going to look now at chapter 29, verses 31 and following. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. 
And Leah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has put, looked upon my affliction. And look at those next words. For now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, He has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. And then in chapter 30, Rachel says, wait a minute, I'm behind. We've got to get this done. And this is where he ends up marrying not just the two sisters, but their handmaids, which also is a strong do not recommend. It's a way to end up with 12 sons. Uh, and God worked through that. But again, not much direct application for us today from their actions. But their story can help us understand our own story and ultimately the story of the whole Bible. Leah was unlovely. We get a description of that earlier in chapter 29. Jacob loved Rachel, and we're told that Rachel was beautiful. This is verse 17. So Laban had two daughters in verse 16. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak or soft, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Now, I don't know what the problem was with Leah's eyes. Say they, they were weak, like, okay, I have weak eyes, I can't see very far. But the, the contrast in the text is to Rachel's beauty. So there is something, whether it's about Leah's eyes, we don't know for sure what that was, but it meant she wasn't pretty. She wasn't attractive. And she knew it. Her dad knew it. Her sister knew it. Jacob knew it. It's one of those things where like, it seems like everyone knows it. She was not attractive. She was not pretty. And she felt it. And her family didn't help her with that at all. She was unlovely. But then Rachel, what's the contrast? She was beautiful in form and appearance. I don't think I have to explain what that means to any of you today. She was beautiful. And Leah was not. And Rachel was loved. And Leah was not. She was unlovely and unloved. But God loved her. God loved her. And she desperately wanted to be loved by Jacob. Did you feel that just in those few verses that we read? She has a baby. Now, now maybe my husband will love me. Now maybe he'll be attached to me. Now maybe he'll care. She's unlovely. Unloved. But there's something she learns. Now she doesn't learn it in a final way. She gets involved in the competition too with Rachel as it continues in chapter 30. And it's like so many lessons that we learn. Like how many lessons have you learned already in your young lives and had to learn again? Just wait until you're old, right? You go, I thought I learned that already. Lord, I thought I was trusting you. I thought I was ready to follow you. And here I am learning that same lesson again. So she doesn't learn this lesson in a final way, but she learns it in a vital way. Did you notice how it was different when she had her fourth son? There's now my husband will love me. Now he'll be attached to me. Oh, the Lord's given me another son. But then at the end of chapter 29, verse 35, she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. 
which means praise. I will praise the Lord. Now again, she'll get sucked back into the rivalry, want to be loved by her husband more than her sister. But for this moment at least, she knows the love that I need may never come from my father, may never come from my husband, but the Lord sees me and the Lord loves me. And it's interesting because as you know the story of the rest of the Bible, you think about the people who were most important. Think Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but then you think down the line, what was the priestly line? What was the priestly tribe? Levi, right? And probably the the most important Levite was Moses, right? Who would deliver the people out of slavery. Levi was that third son. Not of Rachel, not of the loved one, but of Leah, the hated one. Even bigger than that, what was the name of that fourth son? Judah. Where do the kings come from? Judah. Where does King David come from? Judah. Ultimately, where does Jesus come from? Judah. The woman who's unlovely and unloved, who has no chance, no importance, no value, everyone thinks, becomes the far-off great-grandmother of your Savior. God loved Leah. He cared for her. He worked through her. In some ways, we would think, in spite of her being unlovely and unloved. But the text doesn't say that he did that for her in spite of her. He did that because she was unlovely and unloved. And the story of the gospel is that ultimately we, ultimately we all are unlovely and unloved. You might think, that's not nice. It's true. We all deserve God's wrath because of our sin. We are ones who should not be valued just based on what we have done. But we are. And what's so beautiful about this Gospel is that Jesus, who's the most lovely, and we behold His glory in the Gospel, when He came to save His people, how was He described? Jesus was unlovely and unloved so that we could know God's love and show it to others. Think of Isaiah 53. Speaking of Jesus, He had no form or majesty that we should look at Him and no beauty that we should desire Him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, He was despised. And we esteemed Him not. You could use almost all those words to describe Leah. The people who should have cared for her the most didn't. Her own father, her husband, But the Lord loved her. And more than just loving her, He came and was rejected for her. John 1.11, He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. Jesus was rejected so that we who are unlovely do not have to be unloved. And so we don't need status or achievement. And if you get first chair, great. If you're a concert master, a concert mistress one day in your college orchestra, fantastic. Praise the Lord. And if you're second or third or fourth, that has nothing to do with who you are. Your instrument is not who you are. Your achievements are not who you are. The achievement that you needed that you could never accomplish has been accomplished for you on the cross by your Savior who loved you, who at just the right time died for the ungodly. 
And so all the, the work that we do now is not so that finally he'll love me. It's not let me have another baby and finally my husband will love me. It's I am loved by the Lord and confident in that love. I can work on the gifts that He has given me to use them to love and serve and benefit other people so that truly there isn't competition. The, the best musicians I know, they love to celebrate others and bring others along. That's why the faculty's here this week. They're eager to see you grow. So take advantage of that opportunity this week as you get started in just a couple minutes. But don't put your worth there. Don't put your life there. God has already spoken about your worth, and it's much higher than you could ever achieve. It's what you could never have achieved. Because we ultimately don't need status or achievement. We need the love of the Savior, and we have it. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Oh God, would you help each camper this week to know your love? So whether they feel like they get it at home or at school or at church or anywhere else, or whether they're trying so hard to achieve it, would you help them to rest in the achievement of Christ on the cross in their place? Thank you, Jesus, that you were rejected so that we could be accepted. That you were despised so that we could be loved. Would you help us to feel it and to know it and to love you and love others for your sake today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.